you all hear this? Oh, mine doesn't make a sound at and all. By the way, I'm the. Oh. Okay. You asked for it? We've got the answers. You want to know how Secure 2.0 is going to impact your finances. Brian, I am so excited about this because one of the things we love that we get to do is whenever there's new legislation passed, whenever new things come into being, we want to be able to help you sift through that, help you understand, okay, what does it say? How does it work? And more importantly, how does it affect your financial life? What is actually good, actionable information and what's noise that maybe isn't as exciting as we I, thought it was? I know be. you get excited about this stuff, and but the word love might be a little oversold. I love that we get to do this. I love that we get to I break it down. I actually do not like it when the rules get changed on sure. us because you know we, here we are. We're building. We have a, a, a financial order of operations. We have systems. We have processes, and then we try to stay out of politics. And then what do you know? Our government decides. Hey, let's just. Let's change the rules. Let's 2.0 this thing. And and a lot of us, and I got to tell you, the headlines are deceiving on mm -hmm. what this legislation can do. And, and by the way, I want to give everybody context because this legislation actually covers a lot of things. I mean, we've got military spending. We've got banning TikTok mm -hmm. on government phones. Um, we've got funding for Ukraine. But in, in if, for context, this bill is 4,155 pages. Do you want to know how much is financial related for us? How much? Only 359 pages. That's what we're going to focus on is that 8% that actually deals with your personal finances. And, and I think it is important that we kind of give you the tools mm -hmm. to know how to navigate this because a lot of it is a lot of sizzle and fluff more than stuff that I think you're going to be able to to leave this ready to run through a wall. Yeah, one of the interesting things is, is as soon as this legislation was passed, there were a lot of headlines that started hitting and got a lot of folks, especially parents, getting really, really excited. And as we kind of went through the legislation, Brian, you were like, man, I, I don't know if maybe what's getting the headlines is the thing that should be capturing the headlines because maybe it's not exactly what the public thinks well, it is. Well, that's what, I mean, this is, if you look at, we have this huge piece of legislation, 4,155 pages. If you go look at the headlines that all the financial publications went with, here's kind of what came to, floated to the top. The first thing we see here, new law allows tax-free 529 rollovers to a Roth IRA. That's a true statement. It's just they ought to put an asterisk because there's some catches to yep. it. Next one. Families can make tax-free rollover from retirement 529s to Roth individual retirement accounts starting in 2024. So this all sounds, I mean, I'm even getting frothy. I'm like, man, is there going to be something where maybe, because I, I, I will tell you, only probably less than a month ago, I closed out 2022 by reimbursing me and my, my wife mm -hmm for how much we paid for our daughter's college because sure. we, we actually paid ourselves back from the 529. So I'm like, did I screw up? Because I'm seeing all these headlines yeah. come out. And then here's the third one. Congress just gave education savers a Roth IRA boondoggle. <laughs> so I was like, boondoggle? Boondoggles <laughs> normally are, are a little... Uh, that, that's negative, isn't it? And, and we went and... We're, we're going to save you the headache. We actually went and, and, and looked up boondoggle mm -hmm. to make sure we're using the right definition. And basically, it comes down to it's something that has you do a lot of work mm -hmm. for not much on the results side of the column. That's so right. let's actually jump into what are the rules when it comes to this 529 to tax-free Roth IRA rollover Opportunity. So the first thing to know is what they said is if you're a parent, if you're someone who's overfunded a five to nine, you can now move that money into Roth IRAs for the benefit of the beneficiary. But there's a few things, like Brian said, some asterisks you need to know of. The first one is that when you do that, that actually counts towards the annual Roth IRA contribution limit for that person. So if you have a child that has excess 529 uh, assets and you want to contribute that to a Roth IRA, what you are essentially doing is eating into their $6,500 bucket of Roth IRA contributions that they would be able to do on their own. Yeah, so this will count towards their annual Roth contribution limit, currently mm -hmm. $6,500. 
Um, this also, and this is, by the way, if you need a little more confusion, the lifetime transfer limit to an individual's Roth IRA is $35,000. So anybody who's thinking this is going to be a six-figure opportunity to load up your 18-, 19-year-old child's um, retirement account, no. They've, they, like I said, we already have annual limits on how much you can put into Roth IRAs, mm-hmm. and then you cap that with a lifetime of $35,000. they have already put the governor on this in, in a big way. And, and another way they wanted to prohibit people from trying to game this is that the 529 itself must actually be 15 years old and able to take advantage of this. And you can only use contributions that are made to the plan that have aged five years. So it's not like you can immediately go super fun to 529 and then immediately try to start get those dollars into Roth. That's not the way that this is going to work. Really, again, I think this is a catch-all for folks who get to the end of college and recognize, oh, I have some money left over in the 529. What can I do with that? Well, you remember, I think it's interesting, the original SECURE Act you know, took out the stretch but we're still waiting for some guidance on inherited IRAs and other things. I, I, I do think it's interesting to point out where we have gray areas. Mm-hmm. And this whole thing about 529 accounts have to be 15 plus years old mm-hmm. to even uh, uh, make this happen. What happens if you change the beneficiary mm-hmm. on this account? We don't know. That's a gray zone. You know, I've, I've read multiple articles on this. Some are saying, yes, that's going to reset. Others are saying, no, that, I'm sure that's not the intent. That's not going to have an impact. We have to wait and see. And by the way, don't get in a hurry about this because, like I said, Secure 1.0, we're still waiting for clarification on some of these things. Another thing that you need to be aware of is that the beneficiary, the person who's having the Roth contributions made, they still have to have earned income in order for you to do the Roth. So again, this isn't something where you can start doing this for young children as soon as they hit their 16th birthday and their account's been open for 15 years. Unless they have earned income, again, you are just making Roth contributions that you would have been able to make otherwise, but instead of doing it from money out of your checking account, out of your savings account, you're doing it from their 529. But all the same five to, uh, same Roth rules apply. Yeah, and then the last thing we'd put on here was just the, there's no income limits. Mm-hmm. They didn't cap this thing um, based upon where your income threshold is, like 150000 or something. There's just no income limits on it whatsoever. So where are the planning opportunities? I, before we kind of moved on to the next big thing in this legislation, it, it, Bo's already kind of given this part away. If you've overfunded a 529 or you have concerns about overfunding a 529, this is going to give you another avenue to put that money to work somewhere else just in case. And, and, and if you start thinking about that, This is any type of of student that has an academic scholarship or an athletic scholarship, and maybe you were diligent about saving when they're younger. Maybe this is a nice avenue that you can roll the money in. Um, I want to, and that that led to the third thing I put, but Bo, you had some cold water on this when we talked about the content meeting. I'll let you put it out there because I'd put the third thing was, I was like, man, this is a huge opportunity because if you go to moneyguy.com slash resources, we do have a multi- money multiplier that shows you by at any age, really starting what it takes to become, and maybe it's got a different title, Bo, on what you have to invest to become a millionaire at any age, um, even from zero to age 20. So a lot of people are going to look at this and say, this is a great turbocharge opportunity for turning my kids millionaires, mm-hmm. tax-free millionaires, at retirement, but you you had a different take on that. Yeah, I, what I do is I think I'm worried that it's just another form of economic outpatient care because essentially what you have to say to your child is, hey, I've got these 529 assets that I built for you, and I'm going to start putting them into your Roth IRA, but that means that you won't be able to contribute to your Roth IRA. Well, when my daughters, when my kids get to the age where they're earning and making money and, and have earned income, I want them to actually feel the feeling of deferred gratification, making the choice to put money into their Roth IRA. So they're actually saving for it. I don't want to quote unquote rob them of that opportunity to begin building that savings behavior. I mean, my wife and I certainly, if we want to help our girls out with helping them supercharge their financial life, we can do that. But I'm probably going to leave the Roth bucket there so that they can be an active participant in that. And I'll probably do something similar to you, Brian, where when your daughter started funding her Roth, you did a daddy match. And I think a daddy match is a great idea. And maybe even the $529 could be used for that. But I don't want to just do it for them. I don't want to just put the, all the money into the Roth IRA and not have them have some sort of skin in the game with me. Yeah, I do like this is a priming the pump moment where maybe your kids can, like you said, we do 50 cents on the dollar. In my household, I, I match whatever my daughter puts into her, her, her Roth IRA. 
do, you know, dollar for dollar. Mm-hmm. To, you could do 50 cents. You could do dollar for dollar. We do dollar and do, dollar for dollar in my house. Maybe this is the basket of funding resources that you have. You could actually use an overfunded 529. But don't forget what the main purpose for a 529 is, is that you are saving this for qualified education mm-hmm. expenses. Because if you use them for these appropriate purposes for qualified education, all of the growth is completely tax-free. Now, look, rolling this money into a Roth IRA will also be tax-free, but I just don't want you to lose the why on why you even started funding this because this is, remember, 15 years in the making. Mm-hmm. You have to have that account open. This is not something where you put the money in, take the money out for that Roth. This is going to require a lot of planning, a lot of planning that probably had to happen over two decades already. So I don't think this changes a lot of things. Back to the word boondoggle or much to do about nothing. And then that closes. The last point I have on this is that this all starts in 2024. Mm -hmm. Let me go and prepare you. Everything we're going to cover is going to have a different (laughs) date or year on when it actually applies. So this is going to be kind of an interesting, if you've ever wondered if your financial planner, if your CPA is concerned about the changing landscape financially, you don't because we will always have jobs when you have Congress and legislation that passes with just so much craziness on implementation dates. I feel like some of it was like, hey, the easy stuff. We'll put happening quickly. Things that we're just going to say because it sounds great, but we don't really don't know how we're going to implement it. We'll put that out there somewhere you know, beyond 2025. It does feel like that a little bit in this legislation. So it's interesting to me, Brian, that the 529 to Raw thing is the thing that's gotten all the press. It's been the one that people thought was the most exciting. For me personally, now I get that this will be, maybe this is a hot take. I actually think that one of the most exciting changes is something that happened for retirees. Because when we think about financial mutants and some of the financial mutant problems that people run into later in life, one of these changes did address that. And it's an adjustment to required minimum distribution. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, when you build up pre-tax assets inside of like an IRA or inside of a 401k, the government says once you get to a certain age, you have to start pulling those assets out because they want to start collecting those tax dollars. And as it's written presently, it's age 72. Well, one of the changes that came in Secure 2.0 is that they're kicking back the ages a little bit. RMDs are going up to age 73 in 2023, and it's actually going to go up to 75 in the year 2033. Yeah, this this was interesting. We actually have a chart to show you the different ages based upon when you were born. Um, I, I I got excited about this in, in some ways. I remember when I got my my. I remember when I went for a term life insurance policy, and it was a 30 year term. Mm-hmm. And I think I was 35, and I was like, man. This insurance company is betting on the fact that I'm going to live to be be 65 (laughs) years of age. I got the same feeling when I saw that they're pushing our RMDs up. I was like, man, so the government's giving us more opportunities to expand out how long they think we're going to live and, you know, and get into this. And, And look, here's the here's the planning opportunity in a lot of ways is that we know when people retire, say it's 60, 65 we have a small window of time to turn that tax deferred money into tax free money right. for Roth, through Roth conversions and other things. This just gives us more time. It also is going to allow anybody who's worried about, hey, when I start taking those RMDs, all of a sudden my income taxes are going to artificially be pushed higher, where I'm going to pay more income taxes. That's also going to impact my, my Medicare premiums. Yep. All of that is being fixed as well. Well, it's giving you more time. Fix is not the right word, but more time is the the definitely appropriate word to, to, to put into this planning. So if you are a financial mutant out there and you are getting towards the later years of your career, you should really be focusing on your three-bucket strategy. I mean, we all think about how desperately we want to build those tax-free Roth dollars. But if we're in a higher tax bracket, it's really difficult to walk away from the pre-tax benefit. Now you're going to have a longer timeline, a longer opportunity to begin turn it shifting those pre-tax dollars to Roth. So I think this is a really neat benefit for you to know about. So if you were born before 1949, your RMD age was 70 and a half. If you were born from July of 1949 to 1950, it's 72. If you're born from 1951 to 1959, your RMD, as it's currently written, is going to be at 73. And if you're born after 1960, your RMD is going to be age 75. So now you can start kind of planning accordingly as you think about building up your assets. Um, As a former tax preparer, I got to tell you, this next one is a big deal Mm -hmm. to me. It's because one of the things I think a lot of times 
look, the tax code's complicated, and people make mistakes, not on purpose, not because they're trying to to evade taxes from an illegal standpoint. It's just we're human and we make mistakes. And I've always felt, man, when you screw up your required minimum distribution, in the past, the penalty was 50%. It's a big deal. 50% of what the distribution was supposed to be. So that's so a, that is a big deal. So, a big deal. So I'm very happy to report, starting now in 2023, that penalty has been reduced to 25%. But that's not where it stops. That's just where our headline stops. Because they actually have written in there, if you, if you actually correct the mistake, you realize you've made a mistake, and you correct it in a timely manner, um, really, and, and they had several different things that would trigger that. Like a note, if you fixed it before... Um, the notice date and they are the five, they had all these three mm-hmm. these several different dates they actually will drop that 25% down to a 10% penalty look if we go from 50% down to 10% that's a huge win mm-hmm. for all of us that make mistakes as humans so I, I think that that's a positive thing that they put in this legislation another thing that's interesting related to RMDs is that there are no longer RMDs for Roth 401ks starting in 2024 so we know that Roth IRAs as a vehicle do not have required minimum distributions. What you may not have known is that if you worked for a company and you were building assets in the 401k and you had assets in the Roth portion of the 401k and you retired, but you didn't roll those assets over, that Roth 401k would have been subject to RMDs. Now they are doing away with that. So if you're someone who elects to leave your retirement assets inside of your previous employer's 401k, the Roth portion will not have to be distributed, which is a neat little changes taking place uh, that doesn't affect a ton of people, but it's something that you should be aware of. Yeah, now you now you can actually, if you if you like the ERISA protection and some of the other things, you can actually, if you have a good 401k provider or 403b provider, you might, might want to just let it mm-hmm. stay where it is. It's giving you more flexibility, more options, nothing wrong with that. That moving on to the next big category was changes in catch-up contributions. This was, look, y'all, you guys know. What all, a good uh, year for some yeah, changes. I mean, if you, what if a great you, year for catch-up changes, born huh? Anybody before 1973, you're enjoying all this inflation <laughs> adjustments they've done, uh, just naturally to, a, to, to catch-up contributions. Well, now with Secure 2.0, they're also in creating, it's not just 50 and over that are getting huge benefits. It's going to be 60 to 63. There's some crazy things in here, and we want to cover that with you. Yeah, so the first one is that IRA catch-up contributions. It's, historically, it's been a flat $1,000 catch-up. Now, for those, uh, for those age 50 and over, starting in 2024, it's going to be indexed for inflation. So while the catch-up may be 1000 this year, next year it might be $1,080 or 1100 or 1200 So it'll be nice as time goes on. Our folks who are a little longer in the tooth will have an ability to do an additional retirement savings as they age. Well, yeah, think about this. Now, tell me you don't know how catch up contributions without telling me. And that's what I would say. The legislatures, they were obviously in 2022 only in the mind because the next thing they came up with is they're allowing greater catch up contributions for those 60 to 63. And the way they wrote it was it was the greater of 50% more than regular catch up or Ten thousand dollars, starting in twenty twenty five. Once again, pay attention to the dates because there is timelines on all this. But they, it's the greater. Well, guess what? As soon as we're in tax year twenty twenty three, which welcome, we're here. It's always going to one hundred fifty percent is always going to exceed that ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So um, I don't know why they put that little little tidbit in there, but it, but it is. It's going to be a basically you get to do one hundred fifty percent starting when you're 60, 61, 62, and sixty three. And then the next change related to catch up is that catch up contributions for high earners, those folks who make over one hundred and forty five thousand dollars, and this will be indexed, must be Roth starting in twenty twenty four. So if you are a high income earner, you are taking advantage of the pre-tax benefit by maxing out your salary deferral and doing catch-ups. Now those catch-ups that are going to be increasing will have to go into the Roth side. Again, it's not necessarily a negative thing because we love Roth dollars, but it does mean that your tax bill will go up slightly if you were someone using the pre-tax portion of catch-up. And and for all the sly folks out there saying, well, you know what, if I don't offer Roth options within my retirement plan, maybe that will allow me to still circumvent this? No. The the initial guidance is is that they're just not going to allow catch-up contributions in your plan if you don't have Mm -hmm. Roth as an opportunity. So that's, you know, by the way, maybe if you have some, you know, older curmudgeon that doesn't want to allow Roth in, this might be the reason that they actually add Roth to your to your retirement plan. So that, I guess that's a another unintended benefit, benefit to this whole good thing. Good consequence. So another thing that's happening 
is that there are gonna be some changes to employer plans. Now, this is gonna sound complicated, but I'm gonna simplify it for you. So what the legislation said is that 401k auto enrollment is now mandatory for employers, but employees can still opt out starting in 2025. So what that means is that when you start working for a company, and when you become eligible for their 401k, you will be automatically enrolled. It's gonna automatically say this person is gonna start contributing to this plan unless you opt out. Now, automatic enrollment's always been something that was possible. You could set up some sort of arrangement. Quaka. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Feels like a duck should say quaka, quaka. That's a qualified automatic contribution arrangement, I think is what that stands for, where you would be auto-enrolled unless you opted out. What this is gonna co- what this is gonna cause to happen is that employers are gonna have to be incredibly diligent, making sure they're collecting wage deferral forms where their employees are opting out. So I think practically this is not gonna have a huge impact on folks because I think employers most employers don't want to have someone auto enrolled and then every single year fall and they have to increase it by 1%. And it's going to be a logistical nightmare. It's going to be much easier if you just encourage your folks to get the paperwork back to you so that you can track it. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, it's going to be something that we don't know exactly logistically how it's going to look, but I think it's going to be much to do about nothing. Um, the next one on your employer plans is employers can offer mat- to match employee student loan payments by contributing to their 401k starting in 2024. <laughs> but the way this is written, and we talked about this in the show meeting, because I actually, I'm nerdy enough, I read the executive summary that Congress puts out on what the why was on parts of this legislation. And all they're trying to do here is that they know, and maybe it's because they they watch the, the, the Money Guy show and they have, they understand how financial order of operations works and they know your employer match is so valuable to your wealth building process that they wanted to make sure just in case you come out of college with lots of student loan debt at a higher interest rate student loan debt and you're actively trying to pay down that high interest debt they didn't want you to miss out on your employer match so they wrote the legislation in a way that while you're actively trying to pay down that student loan debt you still get all that free money from your employer. Now, it's important that the employers can offer this. It is not mandated that they do offer this. So there's a chance you'll work at an employer that says, hey, no, if you want the match, you got to put money in the 401k. If you need to pay off student loans, pay off student loans. But no, this is not a mandated change. This is something that they're giving employers the option to do to be able to create an employee benefit around that and like we're playing bingo i'm just going to yell 2024 (laughs) because like i said this thing is all over the place on what years each of these things gets implemented um and then here's another thing i think is interesting Mm -hmm. is employers can now make matching roth contributions but employees pay the tax. What yep. do I mean by this? I've talked about on quite a few shows. We have, and Bo, you, we, you, I give you credit for the three bucket strategy. We always talk about that tax deferred component is for high income people. And then for lower income individuals or younger individuals, it was typically the employer match because you couldn't get out away from it. It was like a stray dog that followed you home. Now it appears we've got a new structure where employers and employees can kind of agree, hey, we are we want a hundred percent of our money going into the Roth bucket, mm-hmm. the tax free growth bucket, but that taxable income, meaning the amount the amount the employer puts into your Roth bucket, will show up as additional compensation on your W-2. Again, this is more, I don't want to say this is much to do about nothing, but if you had a plan that allowed for Roth conversion inside of your plan, a lot of participants were already converting their employer dollars to Roth. Net effect, it's going to be the exact same thing. This is going to be included in your earned income for the year. You're going to get the employer match into Roth. They just simplified the process. They made it a little bit easier to do. So again, it's it's something, but I don't know. It's like it's like super super exciting thing. But if you're young and you're setting it and forgetting it, I mean, then this, this could be pretty, pretty powerful. It's pretty easy. It, it takes away the friction of actually turning more money tax free. And while you're in a low tax bracket and you're young. Load it up. I love it. I think it's a great opportunity. And that's the next point is now you can actually do Roth contributions as part of your SEP or your simple IRAs, which is great. So if you're a small business owner and you've had a profitable year, but maybe you're still not at the higher income level yet, but you want to be doing some sort, some form of retirement savings, you can now do a Roth SEP IRA, which is going to be super exciting, or you can do a Roth simple IRA. Uh, whereas in the past, those were only allowed to be pre-tax contributions going into those accounts. Um, I did see also on employer plans um, that they're allowing, you know, I've always talked about how you, the only plan that was like a DeLorean was the SEP on going backwards. Mm-hmm. 
Actually, on a lot, on salary deferrals for for four hundred one ks, on I, I, I can't remember if it's solo or what. They are going to allow you to go back, but only to April fifteenth of the following year. Mm-hmm. They're going to allow you to get more salary deferrals in. Kind of an important That's, thing yeah. that they've added. So they're really trying to clean up and make it easier for you to save in these big employer retirement plans, even if you're a small business owner. And I like that. So adding SEPs, simple IRAs with Roth components, that's going to be great for all the side hustles and anybody who's starting a brand new company. And then the last employer change is that simple IRAs and simple 401k contribution and catch-up limits are going up by 10% in 2024. So one of the reasons that people often pick 401k plans over simple plans is because they have higher contribution limits. So they're trying to close that gap and increase what you can actually contribute to a simple IRA or simple 401k. Bo, let's kind of close this thing out with some of the other changes, sure. the catch-all components. The first one's a big one. It, mm-hmm. This is, y'all know, I, I, I take advantage of ABLE accounts. I have an autistic daughter. And this one, this one's big because starting in 2026, once again, back to our bingo game of choosing the year, starting in 2026, anyone who became disabled before 46 mm-hmm. is now going to be eligible to start doing the ABLE mm-hmm. accounts Whereas in the past, it was up to 26. Mm-hmm. So this is this is opening up a great deal. Think about what I think about um, is um, somebody who's, earned, you know, maybe a, if you're in the military, if you're in the police, if you're a police officer, you know, or a firefighter, there's a lot of things that where you could become disabled on the job and mm-hmm. stuff. This is going to have a big impact um, because it's not just going to be developmentally challenging younger people. This is going to be people who actually become disabled Um, on the job as well. So I think this is a positive thing. And if you're not familiar with what ABLE accounts are, go to website moneyguy.com, search ABLE. We've done a lot of content on that. They are fantastic uh, planning vehicles for folks who have unique circumstances. So make sure you go check that out. Um, This one, Brian, is one where you kind of want to just walk into the halls of Congress and just start like smacking folks, right? Because this is one that doesn't make any sense to us. Why would they do this? Why would this be something they allow? But now they're making it easier to put annuities into retirement plans. They're making it easier to sell insurance-based products inside of retirement plans. This has me concerned, Brian, because I don't know that this is actually going to be a net benefit to 401k retirement plan participants. Well, the optimist in me is is happy. At least it's happening at a time when interest rates are much higher. And we know a lot of the annuities, especially fixed type of annuities, are tied to interest rates. So that's a positive thing. But I do have something that I'm curious about. Now, I want everybody out there who's watching this or listening to this, I have a challenge for you. I want you to see how fast all those content creators that you've seen on your TikTok and other influential channels where they're telling you your 401k is horrible. You should not be saving in your retirement plan because guess what? They never tell you what the what is, but I can go ahead and and read behind the script. They had insurance products Mm -hmm. that they were pushing in the background and telling you how that was so much better than your employer plan. Now that they can put these insurance-based products inside of these qualified retirement plans, I guarantee... All these same content creators that were out there talking about how horrible your retirement plan are going to be like, oh, this is great. But that guarantee, that's not that's not a compliance thing. That was more of just saying, <laughs> I, Astra, I Astra, bet Astra, a no lot guarantees. of them, no and I bet a lot of them are going to be flipping the script on how much they um how much they like retirement <laughs> plans now. Uh, another interesting change is that uh, QCD qualified charitable distribution limits are now indexed to inflation instead of a flat $100,000. So uh, historically, if you were taking a required minimum distribution and you wanted some portion of that to go to charity, you could send it directly to a charity and uh, exclude that income from your tax return, but it's been capped at $100,000. Now it's going to be indexed for inflation. So if someone has to take very large RMDs and you want to do a qualified charitable distribution, the amount of that is going to increase through time. It is. I mean, this is just nitpicking them. I think it's interesting that we left QCDs as you're only able to do this once you reach 70 and a half. Doesn't people, make any sense. If you fast forward three or four years in the future, people are going to be like, what's 70 and a half? They're not going to remember, you know, why 70 and a half because it used to be the required minimum distribution. I don't know why they left mm-hmm. that clunkiness out there, but it's there. It's now just going to be some random 70 and a half. I don't know why it's not. You you threw out the idea in the content meeting. Maybe this should have been 59 and a half. I, I think that would make tons of sense if be, they did 59 Because remember, and a half. QCDs don't actually, you don't show this as a charitable deduction on your, your tax return. You don't get an actual itemized deduction for this, but it just lowers your income. So really, I mean, I will say this primarily impacts retirees because it has a, a, a net benefit on your 
your your social security benefits and how much is taxable and also on your medicare premiums but why not if it's not tied to anything like 70 and a half is just now arbitrary it's not a required minimum distribution let's open it up even more so we can get more money to charities i think that's a great idea another change and this is an interest and there's gonna be a national uh, database for lost or forgotten retirement accounts starting in 2024 but if you're a financial mutant there's a good chance you probably aren't gonna have a lost retirement account we always encourage you that when you leave an employer you leave a job you keep track of those assets. You either roll it to an IRA, uh, keep tracking it, your current employer, roll it into the new plan. But for some folks who have abandoned accounts or maybe you moved and the mailing address didn't get changed, there's going to be a database, kind of like, you know, I think each state has um, lost property databases where you can go search. It sounds like it's going to be fairly similar to that. And then the last thing that they put on here, and you can tell that they, for the winning the biggest award of, we have no idea how we're going to do this, but we're just going <laughs> to write it in anyway because it sounds good. Is the savers credit for low income earners contributing to retirement accounts is now a government match to the account. And that goes into effect in 2027. If you need proof that they don't know how they're going to do this, they pushed it out to 2027. They're like, hey, it sounds good. We get to write it into the narrative, but we don't know. If I had to guess what's going to, because they say it's going to be a match, mm. match to me Which means makes it's it going sound in like your it's retirement going in plan. The account. They can't do that. Do you realize what a colossal disaster it would be? So it's probably going to be. You're going to have to fund it. They're going to give you some type of tax benefit on your tax return. But they didn't want to, they didn't want to get into the details of that. They're probably ready to go home. Mm -hmm. So they just like 2027. So there's a lot of stuff in Secure Act 2.0 and a lot of stuff that we don't know how logistically it's going to play. I mean, a really easy example, you know, a couple of years ago, they passed it where inherited IRAs, you can't stretch them anymore. They have to be depleted inside of 10 years, but they haven't even given exact clear guidance on what is required to that process. We think that a lot of this legislation is going to be the same. As time moves on, we'll get more clarity around how it works and how it operates, and more importantly, how it's going to affect you. So our commitment to you guys is that we're going to stay on top of it. We're going to figure out what planning opportunities exist, what things are actionable, and what things are probably more noise that shouldn't uh, shouldn't captivate a ton of your attention. Yeah, we're going to keep bringing it to you. And by the way, I'm just so happy that they've lost the attention of the Roth IRA conversion. Mm -hmm. The backdoor Roth IRA yep. was not part of the discussion this year. Hallelujah, it saved us from having all the year-end stress of figuring out how this is all going to play out. So we'll keep you up to date. Uh, you know, this is what we're passionate about. We don't love it when the government swerves into our world, but we're going to make sure that you're equipped to handle it well. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out. All right, guys, so you know we love that we get to do this kind of stuff. Legislation comes out, we can decipher through it, we can break it down, we can simplify the complex stuff. But we also love answering your questions. We want to know what you guys are curious about. So right now we have the team out of the wings collecting questions. And with that, Reeves, I'm going to throw it over to you. And how was the chat? Was it good? Were people like, was this good? Was helpful, valuable? People have a lot of questions about the legislation. It seems like a lot on. of people, it seems like you've clarified or, or clarified what isn't clarified, unfortunately. <laughs> but truly, I think that's really helpful just to see like, okay, is this a big deal? Is this not? It seems like Did anybody have bingo for it. the year? You know, if you if you put across the 2023 <laughs> no one across has the said, 2027. said that they have yet. Okay. So sorry to disappoint you. Okay. But yes. Anyway, let's head into this Q&A segment. Thank you for submitting your questions. Um, I've got a few here. We're going to start with Anita's question. If you have access is a 457 the best way to save for early retirement? How do I think about adding a 457 in when you already are maxing out your Roth and can't max out all of your pre-tax accounts? Um, okay, so it's really interesting, Anita. Uh, the question you asked, uh, tell me the first part of a question because the language is really interesting. Is it the best? What, is it the best way to save for early retirement? Is it the best way to save for early retirement? Here's what's really, really unique. Retirement is so unique and so customized to the individual, it would be difficult to say to someone, this is the best way to do it because your circumstance might be unique and what you want to do in retirement might be unique and your goals and preferences and risk tolerance might be unique. So it's hard to say is a 457 the best. Here's what we will say. 457s are fantastic savings vehicles because they operate a little bit differently than traditional retirement vehicles. So a 457, you can put money into it pre-tax, or you can put money into a Roth 457, and those dollars can continue to grow. But one of the great things that happens is when you go to distribute, it doesn't have the same limitations on distribution 
like 401ks or traditional retirement accounts. Generally speaking, with a 401k, you have to wait until age 59 and a half to pull out those, that, those dollars. Or if you retire after your 55th birthday, you can begin retiring at 55. 457s don't have those same types of limitations. So it is a wonderful vehicle and a wonderful mechanism for you to be able to save for an earlier retirement. But it's not the only way you should think about early retirement when it comes to building your assets. Um, I think probably her question, Brian, that she's asking, and I'd be curious on your thought on this is, hey, I'm not maxing out all my pre-tax stuff yet. So if I'm not maxing out my pre-tax 401k, should I be doing the 457 instead? Or how how do I decide between those two types of accounts? Yeah, I wrote down three big things. Bo, you hit the no- first one. I mean, of course he is. If we were playing Family Feud, he's always going to hit the number one um, on what people <laughs> think about first. And that's that 457s do have superpowers. You talked about they don't have the penalties and mm-hmm. other things. So that that's... I got to tell you, that puts in a lot of positive goodwill at the back of 457s. So then you have to move to the next thing that I had written down, which was number two. Is your 457 actually a good plan? Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, does it have good investment options? Is it low cost? Does it have all the features? Because they've added all kind of, you know, you can now have Roth 457s. -hmm. You know, just make sure you've got, you understand completely all the things that you want to have in your financial toolbox. Because there's a chance that that 457 that your employer offers does have every checks, all the boxes, but you need to go through the due diligence of figuring out. And then the third thing, and this ties into kind of where I think you were leading with the question, is what do you need and what can you afford? Mm -hmm. Because I, I first always want you to go back to the foundational of where are you in the financial order of operations. If you go to moneyguy.com slash resources, or if you go to learn.moneyguy.com, you can see all the different ways we have for you to learn about the financial order of operations. Because you do need to get your financial foundation built under you with paying down the debt, getting some cash reserves, and then you can get super serious on how to optimize all of your retirement savings. And there's a good chance that especially if your employer offers a Roth 457, this thing's going to check a lot mm-hmm. of the columns on the positive side that you'll be like, yeah, this thing, if if, if my if 25% of my income, say I make less than $100,000, loading up 25% of my gross income a lot of that's going to probably fall into that camp if yeah. I have a really good 457, but you can't skip the steps. Mm-hmm. You got to do those three things to make sure that it, it does check all those boxes for you. Now, if you, I noticed, Anita, that you said, hey, I'm not in the position where I can max out all my pre-tax accounts, so should I do the 457? Another thing that you should be aware of, though, is if you are someone who has access to a 457, and maybe you are a higher income individual and you do have a lot of ability to discretionarily oh, yeah. save, one of the beautiful benefits of 457s is they, they live in a different part of the tax code than the 401k, so they're not subject to the same salary deferral limit. So it's not uncommon for someone who has access to both, where you can do $22,500 into a 401k and another $22,500 into a 457. So you can really hypercharge, hyperaccumulate inside of your retirement accounts if you have access to both and you have the means through which you can save that way. Yeah, so all my college professors, my doctors that work at hospitals, I'm looking at you because that's where we typically see the double up opportunity. Double up, double up. Uh, was that a little? Yeah, uh, I, I put a little, a little bit in there. You know. I love when he yeah. does lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Anita, thanks so much for that question. We're going to move on to Griffin's question. If I'm 24 and single and planning to retire early, is it still advisable to come back around to maxing my 401k rather than building a taxable bridge account? For some context, he has a 95k salary and has potentially like really good salary growth ahead of him. All right, Griffin. So here's what's interesting. You're 24 you're single, you're planning on early retirement. I'm gonna speak from my experience. I don't wanna uh, put my bias onto you, but I'm just gonna tell you in my story, uh, the things that I thought would be true when I was 24 have changed, right? A lot of life has happened just from my age 24 to where I am now. And I imagine a lot more of life is gonna change from the age I am now until I get to age 50. And so one of the things that's really difficult for younger folks when we're planning out for retirement is we're thinking, okay, I want to retire and I want to retire at the age of 51 in June of that year and I want to have this much in. It's really, really hard to know exactly what that's going to look like. We don't know what our expenses are going to look like. We don't know our family situation, where we're going to live, job, vocation, all that kind of stuff. So what you really want to focus on in these early years is making sure that you are saving aggressively, 
so that you can build for the future. And in our opinion, one of the best ways to save aggressively is to follow the financial order of operations. Brian, Brian you want to hold that up oh, for me? Because yeah. I think oh, it's pretty yeah. cool. Let me give it a little sound, too. You can go to, learn, you can go to moneyguy.com slash resources, download the free deliverable. Because what we love about that is you're 24 single, uh, which means that you don't, you're don't you going to be in a different type of tax bracket. You have a really strong income. It sounds like your income is going to increase. So building up pre-tax assets is probably something that's going to, if it doesn't make sense for you this year, it's probably going to make sense for you in the next couple of years. And one of the best ways that you can build up pre-tax assets and get that current year tax benefit is by maxing out your employer-sponsored retirement account. So if I were in your situation, I don't know that I would just glaze and blaze right through step six. I probably would try to, especially if the tax savings, if I live in a a state that has higher tax rates, and I know my federal tax rate, and that current year tax benefit is super valuable, I don't think it's crazy to think about loading up those pre-tax assets before I start moving to hyperaccumulation of the bridge account. Well, and I'll take it at 30,000 feet, is that even if it's not pre-tax, I still think your employer plans, they, they, Roth is the other option, yeah, tax-free. Right. So I put three things down. I said, follow the tax benefits. That's number one. So that's what, you know, somebody who's 24 years of age, your retirement plan, even if you think you're retiring super early, is going to have tremendous opportunities from a tax standpoint. Because the two biggest things that impact you are obviously taxes and the fees you pay. So be very aware of how much you're paying in taxes. So you're crazy if you don't follow the tax benefits to optimize that. And that's where it leads to number two, which is follow the foo. The foo is going to kick in to help you know when is the right time to build that bridge account. And what I have found is somebody who's, who thinks they're gonna retire early, you're going well beyond saving and investing 25% right. of your gross income. Well, guess what? That's built into the financial order of operations because you're gonna blow through step six, get to step seven, which is that hyper accumulation, which is where you'll be Griffin. And that's where, yes, it's going to start helping you build that bridge account. So follow the foo. It will kick in at the right time to let you know how to optimize your process in retirement. And then just number three I'd written down was three words. I said, I want you to automate, I want you to build, and I want you to believe. Because we have created this system with the financial order of operations where it is road tested and it's set up to help you optimize all these decisions. But you need to, I just don't want you to hyper focus on the noise I want you to kind of, like I said, automate and build by just setting up these buckets, start putting the money in there, and you're going to see the process will actually help you guide and land that plane when it's time to do it. Love it. Great. That was a real Ted Lasso moment. You know how he sticks the believe sign up there? <laughs> automate. That's what, that's what I saw immediately. Build. Believe. Believe. I anyway, like it. I liked it. Griffin, thanks for that question, and thanks for joining us in the live stream today. Question from Kristen. With RMDs going away for 401k Roths, is there any difference between Roth IRA and 401k Roth contributions? Can I contribute only to 401k Roth if my 25% is covered within the 401k Roth? What do you think? So, so I want to remind you, this difference that you're talking about between Roth IRA and Roth 401k is something that, didn't, that did not manifest until you hit age 72. Now it's changing to age 73. Like you didn't have to take required minimum distributions from your Roth 401k until you got there. So what we most often saw is that someone would work for their entire career. They'd build up their assets inside their 401k. And then when they retire, they would roll them over into the pre-tax portion, into a rollover IRA and the Roth portion to Roth IRA. And then they have to worry about the RMDs anyways. So the change that took place really only affects folks that are much, much older, because in actuality, most folks probably roll those assets over. So the real question I think you're asking, Kristen, is what's the difference in a Roth IRA and a Roth 401k? And should I just do the Roth 401k instead? I'm going to start with the first one, Brian. I'm going to leave some meat on the bone for you. Here's the big difference I think that you ought to think about when it comes to the two. When you go out and open a Roth IRA, you get to choose a custodian, you get to choose the investments, you get to open up the entire investment universe, and you get to control what you do with that account, when it happens, how you do it. With a Roth 401k, you're a little captive to your employer. So you hope your employer picked a good custodian and there's good investment options and there's good maintenance and there's low fees and that sort of thing. 
Well, not all 401ks, even Roth 401ks are treated equal. So I would look at the cost of the two plans and make sure that the 401k you're participating in uh, justifies based on the taxes, uh, based on the cost and the investments available for going the Roth IRAs. That's just one thing that I would look at. What are some others that probably well, make sense? Well, I, I thought it was interesting because you, you hit it once again. Number one was how good is your plan? Because I do think I love simplicity. And I was sitting here thinking about the financial order of operations. We know step five of the financial order of operations this is all your tax-free growth opportunities. And for most people, that is going to be your Roth IRA, your health savings accounts. Those are the first stops when you get really excited about building that, that tax-free wealth opportunity. But there is something here where I'm like, man, what if you analyze your plan and it's with one of the big providers, low cost providers like a Fidelity Investments, a Vanguard, a Charles Schwab or something like that. And you're like, wow, this is incredible that I have this 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 chance to go ahead and set it on the front end because I already can't do I can't I can't get twenty thousand five hundred dollars in this plan this year. So, um, you know, maybe this is an easier step for me. And that, and that leads to this number two that I'd written down was how risk risky are you to being sued or mm-hmm. creditors coming after you? Because realize retirement plans do have qualified retirement plans that your employer offers you. Do get some special protections and, and we should pay respect to that. So, uh, but, but then that leads to number three that I wrote down was I like both, you know, because it is one of those things where I want you to be very aware when you're younger and you're starting out. If you go through some of that due diligence, I don't think it's a big deal whether you go and do your homework and open up that first IRA at Fidelity or Vanguard or Schwab yourself, or if you do that same due diligence on how good your plan is and you figure out, hey, this is just as good as if I did it all myself, that I can just easily set it up with my employer. That's okay until you get to the point that you make enough money that you ought to do both Mm -hmm. because your income allows you and your savings habits and your behavior allows you to actually maximize both opportunities. Don't forget that that's an option too. And I'm going to throw in just three things uh, to keep in mind. Roth IRAs have a contribution limit of 6,500. Roth 401ks, you can do 22,500. So you can save a lot more in the 401k than you can in the Roth IRA. Oh, I said I said last year's number. Look at that, 22,500. That's I, getting to be some real money now. Woo! I love it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if your employer offers a match, you want to make sure that you're getting the match inside the 401k. So you would not want to just go straight to the Roth IRA without contributing to the 401k so that you can maximize the employer match. You want to take that into account. And then the other thing, this is just a little side benefit that you should never use. If you put money in a Roth IRA, you can always get to your basis penalty-free and tax-free. So if you are saving inside of a Roth IRA and you're doing the 6500 you can always get to that money easier. If you're doing that inside of your Roth 401k, unless your plan allows in-service distributions or loans or something like that, it's really hard to get to those dollars. So technically, the Roth IRA is a little bit more easy to access earlier on. Although you should never do that. Those are just three things I would assess as I'm thinking through Roth IRA or Roth 401k. I like Brian's answer the best. Do both of them because we think they are both awesome. Great question, Kristen. Thanks for joining us in the live stream today. Let's move on to Chris's question. He says, how much should I spend in total on cars for our family? I know Dave Ramsey's rule is less than 50% of your household income on items with motors in them. (laughs) He's also um, familiar with the 23-8 rule, which maybe we could go over. That's our rule. um, But is looking for some more guidance on the total value. So here's here's what I think is interesting, Brian. A lot lot of folks say, oh, automobiles. I mean, we say they're napalm. They're napalm for your financial situation. So you should always buy the most affordable car and you should buy a beater and it should be a few years old. But Brian, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it okay if someone wants to go out and buy a Mercedes or if, a, a Rolls Royce or a Bentley or a Lamborghini or fill in the blank on the ridiculous car that someone might want to buy? Is it okay for people to buy expensive cars? Well, the answer, I, I wish you wouldn't have thrown out like Rolls Royce or Bentleys or something like, cause that stuff makes me just like, Ooh, I don't know if I'd do it that way, but it's, um, but the answer is yes. You, you know, I, I think it's not, I do, by the way, I've seen Dave do that. And I actually, I'm very entertained. He did an interview with Bobby Bones a few years ago and I was amazed at how he could just throw out things like that when they were asking him questions about cars 
Um, I think he even might have had something about boats and jet skis. I That's mean, it was, anything it was, has a motor should yeah, be less it was than fifty percent. Fascinating, and it was a fascinating. But here's what I would say: where we're a little different is that I think it more falls where you are in the financial order of operations. Because remember, you're you're on a journey um, to building wealth, and the thing I just don't want you to do things out of order. Because if you do things out of order and you go and buy the fancy car, because I always talk about the three components of of wealth building is that discipline to live on less than you make. So discipline's number one. And that discipline creates money or margin that you can actually go put to work. And then the third component is, of course, time. You need to have enough money for compounding. What people fail to talk about is that a big component of time is timing as well. Is because if you go buy um, the Corvette at, say, 25 versus the average age of Corvette buyers, which is like 61, (laughs) you quickly realize that the impact on your long-term walk towards wealth is all askew because you'll you'll figure out that you know that money that you spent on that nice car could have worked much better growing in your account. So that's why it's not a percentage of your income. Mm-hmm. It's more of a part of your journey. And I, right. I would tell you that probably comes up with step eight of the financial order of operations. Um, you know where you are prepaying expenses and other things because you've got the 25% of your in- saving automated wealth building already occurring. You've already got your cash reserves locked down. You've got all your debt locked down. Um, that that's where I fall with this. It's not as a percentage of your income um, because we already have built into the 238 that if you're buying an expensive car, you have to pay cash for it mm-hmm. or pay it off within 12 months. So that's the same as cash. So um, that, we've already kind of put some guardrails up. I'm just trying to make sure you don't forego retirement savings and other things that actually create wealth, not make you look mm-hmm. wealthy. You need to make sure you get that down first. And so it sounds like, Brian, you're describing two different uh, two different areas or stages of life. If you're someone young, accumulating in the early stages, make sure you're adhering to 23.8. And that's across all the vehicles that you own, right? All the vehicles that you own, the service on those should not be more than 8% of your household monthly gross income. So that's falls inside the 23.8. But even when you are later in life, and maybe you do have the ability to pay cash because you're higher income, you want to make sure that foundationally you've built enough wealth that it's okay that you go buy that Tesla or that BMW or that Mercedes or fill in the blank, but you want to make sure you're not doing it to the detriment of your overall financial plan. I, I will say one more thing on this is because once you get to a level of success where you can afford to do this, I would challenge you because I always now find myself thinking about what it's not what you spend. It's what that money could become. Cause mm-hmm. when you get into spending a hundred thousand dollars for a vehicle, I start thinking about, well, like, cause when we do commercial real estate or other things, I'm like, man, when I put a hundred thousand dollars invested into something, could generate this much mm-hmm. for me. That's a that's also a mindset that I would challenge you to because it's it will keep you honest because you will get to a point where money doesn't matter. It's just a tool. Um, and, and maybe buying a nice car, if you're worth $10 million, $15 million, who really cares mm-hmm. if you spent $150,000 on a vehicle? But it's going to keep you honest. If you're on one of those people, maybe you're only worth a million dollars and you're thinking about going and buying a $100,000 car. It really ought to tinge in the back of your mind. What is the opportunity cost of what I'm walking away from by buying this expensive car? I love it. Good answer, guys. Thanks so much for your question, Chris. Hope that, hope that helps you out a little bit. Patrick has a question. Should you take out your Roth IRA money first or your 401k money first when you start hitting retirement? All right. So should you pull out your Roth IRA or your 401k? Again, I've given this disclaimer before. I'm going to give it again. No two retirements are the same. And so the cadence through which you pull your assets out and from which account from which accounts you pull them out of are <laughs> Alexis talking on my side. The cadence from which you pull money out and the accounts that you pull them is customized based on your unique situation. So to say that one always makes sense would not be practical. I will give you a general guideline. You know, we talk about the financial order of operations and how we accumulate, how we build the buckets. What most often happens is we build Roth first and then we build pre-tax next and then we build after tax third. When you go to turn that bucket upside down and start taking it out, it kind of comes out in that order in the majority of circumstances. You pull taxable assets out first, then you pull pre-tax assets out, and then you pull Roth assets out. Brian, why is that the case? If that's well, the way I, that we do it. I mean, I immediately had a visual, and I'm just going to share this. I always get a visual of like Gollum. 
And he's like, my precious. <laughs> and I know when I get that tax-free money, because the government restricts how much you can put in these accounts. I mean, think about what they let you do. They only let you put in that $6,500 in the Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. They only let you put in the 22500 in the Roth you know, in your qualified, K. it's not like you can put unlimited. They'll let you put anything you want in your taxable account. You know, if you can save a million dollars this year, put a million dollars in that thing. They're okay with that. But that tax free, he's got restrictions on it. So I always find myself when that money's in there, I, and it feels good when that money's growing tax free yep. too. I mean, you feel really yep. good. So because it becomes your precious. I have found with retirees, because there's also legacy value to these Roth mm -hmm. accounts, too, is because realize even though they got rid of the stretch IRA with the original SECURE Act, you still get your beneficiaries will get 10 years of tax free mm -hmm. growth with that Roth account. You're, you're going to think it's the precious for them, too. So, I mean, it, it's just I, 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 I tend to now look, it's very you, we have to put a disclaimer. We don't know your personal situation. But from what we've experienced, most people really like that tax-free growth and want to maximize that opportunity since it is so restricted by the government. But I would say that uh, make sure you're thinking about when you get to retirement. I mean, this is one of the times when it probably does make sense to think about taking the relation to the next level because there are some things that you want to be aware of, some strategies that you might want to know about when you first retire because maybe you only want to max out the very lowest income tax bracket, pulling that from your pre-tax assets. But if you need other income for other purposes or other things you need to purchase, then you might have to go into one of those other two buckets, the after-tax bucket or the Roth tax-free bucket in order to, to subsidize that. But it's something that is so specialized and so customized. You want to make sure you have a solid, you, you, you had a plan building these assets. You had a plan building up this wealth and you spent so much time doing it and thinking about it. You ought to spend an equal amount of time thinking about and taking seriously how you're going to distribute those assets and how you're going to live off of them. Patrick, great question. And remember, if any, if you ever get to that point where what? I was going to say, before you get to go, go ahead and finish this out. So we don't screw up the highlight. <laughs> Probably too late for that. <laughs> but that's okay. No, I was just going to remind people. I know we were just talking about um, those more complicated situations when you might want to take it to the next level um, at moneyguy.com. There's a little button called work with us. You can click on that and learn a lot more about what that looks like and even fill out a form to get connected with someone and explore that if you wanted to. Ryan. Okay. Y'all get a little extra here today. I need somebody to go in my office. There's a notebook paper on my round table in the, in the new office. I just need it because this thing's at 2%. We forgot to charge it. And I, it's going to die any moment now. Because I've been counting hold down on, hold from 10%. Can I just give you a sticky note? Well, I mean, we could do that. Just I mean, go, but, but, I mean, go I have a pen. I have a paper. You know how I like to write notes. So we've been, I've been watching it, and I was like, man, is this maybe this is going to be the intersection because we're oh, only a few more away. But if you have a pen, I can just give you a sticky well, note. Well, but I would have to have asked you for that sticky note, too. We might as well get to the exact same point. And no, plus, uh, no, I don't no, write no. like a, a doctor no, who no. writes a teeny tiny <laughs> script. You actually can read my writing. I'm on board. I'm on board with this. Yeah, you yeah. guys. You we're guys, here uh, now. This part was for free. This no, I apologize. This is kind of I was hoping, I was really stream. hoping that this thing was going to make it, but I've been watching it and it's, it's creating stress now that we're down to 2%. Because you know, they don't actually have 2% left. This thing's just going, I'm going to be mid sentence writing something that's just going to go boop. And I, I wanted to avoid the boop. While we're waiting on that, how about the, here goes, here how about right the bulldogs? Yeah. How about, about the bulldogs? Uh, Y'all like the subtle red and black? We didn't want to we just overwhelm had, you guys with the timing. We have had a few people be like, oh, they're matching. Or, yeah, oh, well, the we did not plan colors, to twin it up, Georgia. but we kind of twin it up today. Well, I, 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 you were thinking the same thing I was in the fact that we won the national championship back to back. <laughs> but it's, a, it's one of those things. We didn't want to overwhelm everybody with, with all of our Georgia gear because these highlights and these videos yeah, sit up for, for years. Time. And... and Look, there's probably a lot of Ohio State, the Ohio State people that are watching this. I'm sorry, Reed. Look at Reed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Who are probably like, man, if we had just beat those guys, because we did beat them in all four quarters except for the last uh -huh. minute, we'd be national champs right now. There's a lot of truth in that. Well, fantastic. <laughs> we are going to do a few more questions, so keep them coming, guys. Oh, man. <laughs> are you ready to jump back in? I think so. You I good? think so. Yeah, yeah. We still got 2%. We're going to keep it on this thing until it dies. He's not even going to be using the notepad. That's oh, all going to be for naught. You know what, Bo? Well, you know what? Dang, can I hand you this? Oh, my well, word. Just leave just it on the Just sit down, Brian. <laughs> You're going to make him walk all the Thank way you, back Dan. around. Oh, Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let's oh, plug that bad goodness. boy in. Okay. Oh, dang. Dang, I'm going to throw this touch. 
Oh my word. Okay. Listen, we do have fun around here. If anyone wondered. All right, let's rip into these last few questions. That's great. All right. Michelle has a question for you guys. Giving is a major part of our finances, she says. There are tax advantage ways to give significantly upon death, but how do we give as much as possible yearly while we're living? So one, Michelle, I love that. Uh, if, you, if, you've, if you've done our financial order of operations course at learn.moneyguide.com, you'll know that one of our ground rules, one of our step zeros is generosity. Uh, we all, I think, can remember different parts in our life where someone or some entity or something was generous and it allowed an opportunity for us that maybe did not exist previously. And so one of the things we get to do as we have success is give back and pour that back into the world and the people around us, which I think is awesome. But just because we're charitably minded and we want to be generous, we want to give, doesn't mean that we have to do it inefficiently. And so your question is one we often get because somebody might have a big income year. They might sell a business, sell a piece of property, sell a piece of land, and they want to make large charitable contributions or they want to make a big contribution. I'm going to tell you the first thing to watch out on because we've seen this happen before in the past. You want to make sure you understand how the tax code treats charitable contributions because you may be surprised to find out that not all of your charitable contribution may be deductible if you give too much. It's only deductible or up to a certain percentage of your income. I want to say, and I'm going off memory here, tax man, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If you're gifting cash, I think you can only take a deduction of up to 50% of your income. And if you're gifting property or like appreciated securities, it only goes up to 30%. So you want to make sure that maybe you got a big inheritance. And from that big inheritance, you want to give a big charitable gift. Be careful not to give too much in one year or else you might not be able to get that deduction. You may want to stagger your gifting over a number of years so that you can take advantage of that deduction. Now, Brian, save that. Save the the uh, scenario where someone wants to give a big annual gift because of something big that happened. What are some ways that Michelle can give very generously in a large way on an annual and ongoing basis. Yeah, M- Michelle, I love this question. And I wrote down three big things uh, that, that on it. I will tell you that um, I hate that there is this perception that there's more opportunity when you die. Because I think if you can actually, if you can be generous while you're alive, you get to enjoy a heck of a lot more of seeing the the Fruits fruit of, it, of yeah. your of your you know of essentially your what you your blessings and resources out and about instead of waiting until you die. Um, so so I, I, would, I encourage you, because there are plenty, the government does encourage you to give while you're still active. You don't have to wait until death to be generous. And that's why we make it step zero. It's actually part of the ground rules of the financial order of operations, because we want you to be generous throughout. I wrote down three things, because this is what Bo is alluding to. Number one, appreciated assets. Mm-hmm. If you have appreciated assets, you've been investing, you've been successful, you're blessed with the fact that your, your, your fruits are growing, then you should pay attention to those appreciated assets, because the government gives you a win-win opportunity in the fact that you could not only give money to charities of these appreciated assets, they get to take the full fair market value at the day you give the the contribution. You don't have to pay income taxes on that gain. So you mm-hmm. get to actually skirt paying the income taxes. So if you bought something for 10,000, now it's worth 20,000. I used to give Tesla as the example. That's kind of you know, gone down the, <laughs> the so drain a little anymore. bit, but, but just, but seriously, there's lots of equities long-term um, and even if it was Tesla, maybe if you bought it in 2018, you still are up like 400%. Sure. So I, 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 Elon, don't get mad at me. But it, but it is one of those things. If you have appreciated securities, you could put the money in um, and, and you don't pay. So you put $10,000 and it's that $10,000 of gain because the, the charities go get the $20,000 benefit. You're not going to pay income tax mm-hmm. on that. And you get the full charitable deduction on your tax return at the $20,000 yep. at the higher fair market value. That's a win-win. Now, a lot of people, if you're a tither or you're a person that wants to give on a consistent basis, I think you can turbocharge this strategy. This is financial mutant territory here. And the fact that what you can do is if you are going to give consistently, you can give out of those appreciated accounts 
But then you can also, instead of you, if you were giving cash naturally to these organizations, you can now have that money go back into your investment account that you just gave out of to replenish the investment and buy right back into a lot of these securities. Because what that does over the long term, it allows you to replenish your assets to keep growing. It also is pushing your basis higher. Mm -hmm. So in case you had an emergency or an investment opportunity of a lifetime, you actually have easier access to your money. But pay attention, step one, if you have appreciated assets. Number two, what are your long-term plans? Because I always, if you are a person that you know this, this is very important, and you do have appreciated assets, you can start focusing on the why of what you want to do. Because just like retirement's a big goal, if you have big aspirations with your charitable giving, because, and Bo, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I know I've always been impressed. You've told me, like, I know you've had thoughts about seeding churches. Sure. You've had thoughts about doing And you were, that's built into part of your plan. Absolutely. I think yep. that, that having that long-term mindset is tremendously valuable. And then there is a next level. Just like we talk about, take the relationship to the next level. If you're When you're trying to figure out, can I stress test my retirement? Can I make sure I'm optimizing? I've only retired once. You guys have retired people thousands of times. It's the same way with next level type of a charitable giving because there are crats, cruts. There's all kind of yep. funny acronyms that you can use. We're not going to cover that in a podcast or YouTube because guess what? There'd be six of you who'd watch it. But we are, it is something that once you graduate to the next level, there are ways that you can do this in an even more turbocharged way that we try to help clients with. Now, and I do just want to throw one other thing out there because we are getting close to tax time. When you go to do your tax return this year, if you are someone who's charitably minded, I want to look at what you gave last year. And I want to make sure that, did I get to take full advantage of the deduction? Because the standard deduction now is so high. Yeah. A lot of folks, maybe I give, I'm going to make up a number here, I give $10,000 a year to charity as a married couple. But when I look at that $10,000 and I add my salt taxes to that, and I look at the other things that my mortgage interest, I'm just right at that standard deduction limit, or maybe I'm even a little bit below that. A really interesting planning idea is maybe instead of giving $10,000 this year, what if I save that money up and I give $20,000 every two years? You're going to be able to capitalize on getting a greater tax deduction from bunching your contributions than from doing it each year. So it's just something to think about when you're looking through your tax return, a way to optimize and make sure you're getting the biggest bang for your buck from a tax standpoint. Great question, Michelle. Thanks so much for submitting it. We're going to move on to Juan's question. He says, why wait till 500K to hire a financial planner? Shouldn't you work with one now as soon as possible in order to get to 500K as efficiently as possible and in order to ensure you don't many, make any mistakes on your way up? Yeah, so used, used to, Brian, and, and I, I want you to speak to this a little bit. It used to be really hard to get financial advice, right? Like when you had to, if you wanted to go buy a stock or open an account, you'd have to call a guy and you'd have to have, or, or a girl, and you'd have to have them open the account and place the trades. Well, technology, this thing that we keep in our pockets has changed the world a little bit. Now we have a plethora of information available to us. We have blogs and podcasts and articles and YouTube channels and books and all these different resources that can help us make really sound financial decisions. And the good news is, is when you're first starting out, when you're early on your financial journey, it's not incredibly complicated. The steps are fairly basic. Make sure you've got some money saved up for an emergency. Make sure you're living on less than you make. Make sure that you follow a budget. Make sure that you're saving for the future. Well, if you can do those things early on, it's not incredibly difficult to set yourself up for a lot of success. And so what we tell younger folks earlier on in their accumulation journey is, is that right now, in the very beginning of your journey, every dollar that you can pull together is going to be so much more valuable building up your army of dollar bills, following through on the financial order of operations, than paying a financial advisor's fee. Can they come in and add value and tell you some interesting things? Absolutely. But I, could, I would argue right now, you could tune into this podcast or watch this YouTube channel, and you're going to get a lot of that content. You're going to get a lot of that information that you can take and in 20, 30 minutes, go implement yourself. So why on earth would you want to pay a fee for that when you could take those hard-earned dollars and let them accelerate your wealth building journey? That's why we like to say early on in the game, early on in your wealth building, use the resources that are available to you and focus on save, 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 save 
until you do hit that critical mass number. Yeah, it's um. Gosh, you, there you go. You grab the words right as I love it. You, family. You'd be dynamite on Family <laughs> Feud. I mean, we ought to go on. I mean, re- seriously, we could crush it. Because, Is it still, it's still Steve Harvey, right? Oh yeah, Steve hey, Harvey. Steve, would if love you're a fan. Us. We'd love to do like a money guy family feud. Let us let us know. You have your people I mean, you're just good. People. The only problem is we'd have to do all the answers coming through Bo first. So, you know, we kind of <laughs> need to just capture all the, the other team's mistakes. But, okay, here's what I wrote down. Number one was know thyself. Because I, I, I want to be careful because um, some of you, I, I think sometimes I'm guilty as a financial mutant that I just assume everybody knows a lot of the things and they're motivated by the same things of optimizing and so forth. But but Juan, you know whether you're going to do something versus because I uh, versus somebody not doing something because I'm always amazed when we talk about mortgage debt and other things. People are like, yeah, that might work by math, but I don't know anybody who is actually putting that money to work versus paying down the debt. And, and I'm realizing there are probably a lot of people that just because you can see it in the credit card stats when yep. over half the country doesn't pay off their credit card every month. There are a bunch of people that are screwing this up. Mm-hmm. So I, I do want to be careful to say. That that five hundred thousand is for everyone because it's it's really what I think for financial mutants because I think there's a lot of people probably maybe you do need a personal coach like Bo you're gonna work out whether somebody I'm t- I'll, I'll apply this to physical health yeah. you're gonna work out whether you have somebody nudging you I need to pay a, a gym membership or something to make me do it because I'm just so not liking the process of mm-hmm. staying fin- you know physically healthy so know thyself is the first thing I wrote down. Number two is, is that we really, and Bo touched on this too, is that the do-it-yourself resources because of technology and innovation are dynamite Mm -hmm. right now. I mean, they are to the moon on how much opportunity you have to go out there through podcasts. In 2006, we've been, we've been blazing that trail and then taking it into to YouTube and even into the, some of the newer things of Instagram, TikTok, and so forth. There's lots of stuff. Now, look, there's a lot of bad stuff out there, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but it is. I think you can hopefully the, the, the good stuff rises to the top so you'll know where the, the resources are. But there's a lot of opportunity for you. And that leads to, and Bo said it in his closing statement, is critical mass is definitely important. So, Juan, what I worry about is that in the beginning – your decisions should be pretty simple. I mean, because it really is as much as, and that's why we have the financial order of operations, moneyguy.com slash resources. You can see it. We're really trying to just build up your financial foundations through deductibles covered, you know, employer match, because that's free money, paying off the high interest debt. We're trying to protect you from yourself, but these are easy, understandable concepts because all I want you to focus on is how do you get to that critical mass where when you make 10% on $500,000, that's $50,000. That's replacing potentially a full year's worth of living expenses. 10% on $5,000 is $500. That's a, that's going to maybe be a, 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 you know a, a road trip or... Um, this month's food, you know, or some, you know, like a grocery store or whatever, but it's not going to be replacing full amounts. So you have to focus on how do you get to your assets being at the size that they truly replace you working so you control your time. You, you're, you're, you're kind of at, at, at the, the, the true independence level. And that's why I wanted to take away all the distractions because there's so many in the financial world. The easiest thing to do is that's why we talk about indexed, target retirement funds is because you just have to know how much can you save Mm -hmm. focus on that just like Bo said when do you need it they do everything else for you so that you can focus on making more money spending less money being purposeful with what your why is how do you get the career not the job those are all the things to focus on I just don't want you getting busy doing nothing focusing on this financial game when there's a lot of this stuff could be, you know, really automatic for the people and be created an automated, automated wealth building process. Mm-hmm. That's where your resources and your calories and your horsepower, mental horsepower should be focused on. Good question, Juan. Thank you so much for submitting that. The Green family has a question. I am 35 and my job currently has a pension and offers a non-matching 401k. I'm currently maxing out my Roth IRA. Should I be contributing to my 401k or are there other better options? Um, Mr. or Miss Green, uh, I, so one, you're 35 with a pension. That's amazing. Pensions aren't really a thing that exists for a ton of folks anymore. So 
your employer or the entity for which you work has now said, hey, we're going to build a thing that's going to be there for you when you retire, that's going to produce some sort of standard of living for you. That is awesome, assuming that it's well-funded and it seems there's a going concern that it's going to be there. But now you're in the situation thinking, okay, well, how do I begin building up my other types of wealth, my other outside wealth, and your 401k doesn't have a match on it. And that's not incredibly uncommon for employers that provide a pension plan. They're saying, hey, we're already doing this over here, so we're not going to provide a match. Don't forget, there are other benefits to a 401k besides simply the match. If you're someone who's in a higher income area or a higher income cost of living area and you have a high state tax rate and high marginal rate, the 401k provides one of the best ways to legally hide money from the government and decrease your tax bill or you're younger and if you are in a lower income situation, it's a great place to build up tax-free Roth assets if your 401k has the Roth contribution options. There are other benefits to the 401k besides simply and strictly the match. So Brian, here's my question for you. Someone who's in this situation who says, yeah, it doesn't provide a match, what should they follow or how should they go about figuring out where their next dollar should go? Is the 401k one of the places they should still stop at on their journey? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to look at it. You, you hit number one was follow the tax benefits for somebody a higher income, that's current year tax savings. For somebody younger, that might be tax-free growth opportunities. I think you have to pay attention to what can ERISA protected plans do for you that Roth IRAs can't do. And that's like creditor protection and basic things like that. That's unique. And then the third thing, is really, and this is what you're alluding to, Bo, is don't skip that due diligence. That's where you have to look at your plan. Because look, it sounds like your employer, they have a pension, they have a non-matching 401k, that a lot of these things, if they're putting in money automatically without you putting, that means they're probably, they're they're loading this thing up on the executive side of it. Yep. So I would want to know, how good is this plan? Is this something that a golf buddy of the owner set up or a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law, or is this something that... Um, that actually is like got world-class low-cost investments, has really good diversification options. Pay attention to those things because it, it, it comes to the fact that you might want to go to the employer plan because of you get that creditor protection, you get all the benefits outside. But then also if you're in a situation, I'm back to both. I mm -hmm. love it when people can do not only the, the IRA fun functions, but also their employer because that allows you to follow back to step number one, which is follow the tax benefits. Mm -hmm. I love maximizing all of those things because that's where that's the, really where the, the the brilliance or genius of the financial order of operations is it tries to build what to do with your next dollar from an optimization, not only from taxes, but also from what are the three buckets you'll need to, yep. to, to, to master or do well in the retirement transition from saver to spender it's all built into the system. And that's why I think people think, man, they're always talking about that financial order of operations. Yes, because it's that good. And that's why we make it free if you go to moneyguy.com slash resources. And of course, you get in there and you realize, man, this is so good, but I know there's some nuances to some of these rules and changes and everything else. Go to learn.moneyguy and we actually have a deep dive course too. Love it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. We love hanging out with you, trying to break down the complex into something simple and actionable that you can follow and hopefully really uh, watch your money grow. So thanks so much for hanging out with us. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central. Hey, guys, I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hanson for Money Guy Team. Secure 2.0. We're out.